Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Just to let you know, we will start the presentation in about one minute. Thank you so much. Hello again, uh, just to let you know, we'll start the presentation in about 30 seconds. Thank you once again for joining us. An official hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety Health Magazine webcast, Electrical Risk Assessments for Shock and Arc Flash, sponsored by eHazard. This is Alan Ferguson, Associate Editor with Safety and Health, and I'll be moderating today's event. Thank you so much for joining us, and before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items. As a disclaimer, the views of today's speaker and organization are their own and do not necessarily affect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the Council of the Magazine endorses those items. After today's presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session with our speaker. If you have a question, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your question, and press the Send button. We welcome your questions at any time during today's event. You don't have to wait for the Q&A be to begin. We might not get to every question, but the good news is unanswered questions will be forwarded to today's sponsor. Also, after this presentation, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, and I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. Just to let you know, this webcast will be archived, so you can access it after today's live event to view this webcast and all of our past webcasts. Please visit safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events, or you may receive a link in our post-event email. With that, let's introduce our speaker. With us today is Zahir Juma, partner and professional engineer at eHazard. Zahir performs electrical workplace safety training consulting, Arc Flash Engineering Studies, Electrical Network Design, Incident Investigations, and Safety Audits. He's a member of the IEEE, ASTM, and IEC committees and has contributed to the NFPA 70E standard. Zier also currently serves as a technical paper review chair for two IEEE journals and is an incoming chair for the 2025 IEEE Electrical Safety Workshop. Again, we thank you all for tuning in this present presentations are here whenever you're ready take it away thank you so much for that introduction alan i appreciate it and folks thank you so much for making time out of your day to join us just before we get started there's something i want to mention um you all have followed me on my webinars before and obviously you know i like to keep things practical because i think there's a big gap between what the standards say that we need to do and how do we make that into plain simple language I don't want us to just be focused on electrical arc flash and um, electrical shock risk assessments. If you have any questions related to anything electrical safety, uh, be it arc flash compliance, be it electrical shock, be it auditing, be it uh, maintenance, be it whatever, please drop those questions on the comments. The other favor that I'm gonna ask you is, I go about my day-to-day -day work and I speak to electricians, I speak to safety professionals, I speak to owners of companies, and they ask me questions. I then take those questions as a basis for developing a webinar, developing a blog, writing an article, and I need that feedback from you all. So why don't you all take a minute now while I'm running through the introduction of today's webinar and tell me what's on your mind. What would you like to see us talk about in the future webinars that we have? We don't do too many of the safety and health webinars on electrical safety. So, you know, just having that general consensus of, hey, people are interested in learning a bit more about, I don't know, engineering studies or NFPA 70B maintenance requirements or electrical vehicle safety, whatever that is, uh, let us know. That really makes a difference in the webinars that you all are seeing. So without further ado, why, why risk assessments? You know, so many people speak about this risk assessment term and they say, oh, have, have, have you performed a risk assessment? And is your risk assessment documented? And really folks, it is pretty difficult to take something so academic, something so theoretical and make it practical. And that's what I wanted to do 
with this webinar. I wanted to make it practical. So let's just start off with getting you into this right frame of mind. When you were a kid and you were spinning around and you started at one spot and you spun around until you were dizzy, how easy was it for you to stop and point to a tree in the park or stop exactly in the direction facing the bench on the right? How easy or how difficult was that? Just think about that for a second. Now, think about us as adults trying to write a report, trying to get an email out. We start at one point, we have an end goal, but we get spun around. And this happens to everybody. I think it happens to me more, uh, more, more, more so, but um, because my attention's all over the place. But think about an electrician, think about an engineer who's opened up a panel and is busy working on this. And while they're working on this, they see this wrong, they see that wrong. Somebody sent them a text message, hey, I need you to be here. So task not only change in the middle of the task, but sometimes the task in its entirety changes. We may have gone in looking at some disconnect not working and we end up finding a cable that needs repairing and things change. So it is so important that this risk assessment not only be at the forefront, but you all as the electricians, as the engineers, as the safety professionals, as the managers, that you all are aware of this isn't easy. This isn't something that you can just use standard language. Oh, you need to perform a risk assessment and yeah, you've got to keep the risk. Yeah, but what does it mean to the person on site? So what I have noticed, and we have done several accident investigations. I've been an expert witness on these and I've learned from them that we have seen serious burn injuries and shock and fatalities occur through three main drivers. And folks, these are the three main drivers. They're not the exclusive drivers. Is that you have a change of scope, you have incorrect judgment, and you underestimate the risk, right? Think about these carefully. Change of scope. I may go in to find um, an overload that's not resetting, but I open up the panel and I find out that, oh, I've, 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 I've got a wire loose here. I've got a screwdriver with me. So why must I come back? Why don't I just tighten this? And have you really stuck to your scope or have you changed your scope? Incorrectly judging your ability that eh, it's just a simple wire. I, I, I can tighten this. I mean, this is just a screw and um, you know, I've got a screwdriver with me and I just got to turn this. But have you really given this some thoughts of what can happen while I'm doing this? Or is your mind still occur, stuck on, oh, this overload isn't resetting, but while I'm trying to do this, I'm gonna quickly tighten the screw. So that judgment of ability. And then with that, we underestimate the risk. We say, oh, this is a small little control panel. This is a small little panel board. What's the worst that can happen? Folks, we've seen some pretty worse stuff happen, okay? And you know, actually sometimes it gets so bad that it is worse than worse. Okay, and um, you all know I have fantastic English, right? So uh, yeah, we're gonna make up some words today as well. So what I wanna do today is, folks, I wanna go back to, I wanna go back to the basics. I wanna try and make this simple. I wanna get this into easy language that the electrician, that the engineer understands. If anything that I say today, because I've got a ton of slides that I need to run through, but I don't wanna just run through these slides, I wanna make sure that they make sense to you. If there is something that you missed, drop a comment to me and say, Zahir, on slide 18, um, I missed you. Can you please spend some time explaining this to me? Drop it on the comments. And when we get this um, Excel spreadsheet back, I'll go through it and I will get back with you. All right? And I'm going to cover the introduction. And then we're going to run through three different elements to the risk assessment. One is identifying what can hurt you, then determining what actions can result in that mechanism causing you harm, in that electricity shocking you, in that electricity burning you, what actions? And then finally, we'll hit the risk control, which means, oh, so I can get burned with this, I can get shocked with this, so what can I do with regards to it? Before I jump into this, I've got a poll question for you, and I've heard this many, many times. So, we have electricians who come back to us and say, oh, you want me to do a risk assessment, but I'm going to troubleshoot. I don't know what the problem is. 
So if I don't know what the problem is, how do you want me to do a risk assessment? I mean, I don't know what I'm going to be doing. So how am I supposed to do a risk assessment? So I want to ask you a question. Is this, is this a correct statement? Is it not possible to perform a risk assessment if you are troubleshooting? Let me know whether you agree or disagree. Let me know, yes, that it is not possible. So yes is the negative. Yes means it is not possible to perform a risk assessment because you are troubleshooting and you don't know what needs repairs, right? Or if you disagree with that statement, then say no. And I'll, I'll give you a few seconds. I'll give you a few seconds to look at this. I will grab a sip of something to drink while you poll. Okay, so the majority of us, about 84% of us believe that you can risk assess it. So here was the trick in this question. It was actually a trick question. When you are troubleshooting, you are troubleshooting. You are using a meter, you are using your eyes, you are following circuits, drawings and stuff. When you find the problem and you pick up a tool to perform a repair that's tighten a screw or push a button, you've actually changed the scope. Because you've changed the scope, right? you would need a new risk assessment. So the reality of it is troubleshooting can always be risk assessed. All right, so folks, let's, let's move on. Let's start off quickly with the introduction. Right? Does OSHA mention risk assessments? And I'm not talking about OSHA published um, uh, an article or OSHA has a presentation. I'm talking about the very core electrical standards for OSHA. Does OSHA mention the word risk assessments? I want to take you very quickly back to the two standards that govern us. One is 1910.269, subpart R for special industry. Now, folks, this applies to power generation, transmission, and distribution folks. Okay. It is accessible only to qualified employees. That is the language that OSHA uses. That means that 1910.269 is not written for unqualified persons. So, for example, let's say, um, let's use um, lawn care, for example. So I've got a uh, distribution yard, I've got grass in there, and I am sending somebody to cut this grass. If this person has not been qualified to the 1910.269 standard, even if I supervise this person, I am not allowed to take this person um, into the electrical installations that apply. I'm not allowed to take them into the yard, okay? But, 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 and this is a big but, is that OSHA states, and the bottom, look at the bottom there where I've got the word underlined equivalent. Can you see? It says equivalent installations of industrial establishments. That means... If you've got a distribution system that looks like a utility distribution system, this 1910.269 is going to apply to you, right? Let that sink in for a second. Just let that sink in for a second. Right. Then the next standard we have is 1910 subpart S, which is electrical. Now, folks, this is the one that applies to commercial industrial users. And the interesting portion is that it applies to both qualified and unqualified persons. So under subpart S, which is commercial industrial users, I'm talking about um, people who are making food products, people who are packaging, uh, people who have like high rise condominiums that are renting it out, for example, all of those are commercial industrial users, right? So what is excluded from here is power generation, transmission and distribution, communications like telecommunications, like your 5G people, your fiber optic people, your cell phone people, vehicles, that means things that move. They're talking about rail, automotive ships, air, ships aircraft, and the railway power systems. That means the, the, the overhead lines, the distribution systems, the switching stations, all of those are excluded from this standard, all right? So I want you to keep that in the back of your head understand which standard applies to you and don't just tell me, oh, Zahir, I'm commercial user, so um, subpart R would not apply to me. No, not necessarily, okay? So, so keep that in your back pocket, right? And here it is, neither or neither, neither or neither, which, okay, it ne ne neither, neither, um, of subpart S or subpart R uses the word risk assessment. They do not use the word risk assessment. So where does this where does this come in? So if you look at 
right? And read through this quickly, folks. I know you are reading through it, right? But what they're saying here is that you need to do a job briefing and your job briefing has to basically keep people safe, right? That is what the job briefing is. What they are asking you to do is basically the stuff that I ran through in the uh, table of contents where it is the hazard identification, the, 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 the risk analysis, and finally, how are you controlling the risk? So indirectly, indirectly, there it is. OSHA is asking you to do it if you are power generation, transmission, and distribution. What if you're not? What if you are other users? Then it's saying employees working in areas where there are potential electrical hazards. Folks, where there are potential electric, if you have not done your risk assessment, how do you know that you have a potential electrical hazard? So irrespective of whether you like the standard or not, okay? Because I speak to a lot of folks in generation, transmission, and distribution, and they say to me, oh, no, 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 NFPA 70E, we, can't use, we cannot use that. We are utilities. And folks, here's what I'm going to say to you. These guys at 70E do a fantastic job of the risk assessment. You don't have to follow the standard if it does not apply to you. If you know for sure legally and professionally and I mean, fill in whatever terms you like in there, that the standard does not apply to you, does not mean that you do not use the standard. There's a golden nugget in the standard, and there's and there's several golden nuggets, and that is um, uh, the risk assessment portion within 70E, and we're going to spend a lot of time on this today, right? But, but I found this letter of interpretation, and this letter of interpretation says that OSHA will, never in, will, will not enforce NFPA 70E, but they may use it to support a citation. So if you go out and you say to OSHA, well, I'm I'm a co-op and I fall under 1910.269 and NFPA 70E didn't apply to me, then OSHA is basically going to ask you, hey, hello, friend, have you ever heard of this thing called the NFPA 70E and they walk you through the risk assessment? And then you say, but yeah, I'm high voltage and I thought 70E was a low voltage standard. Uh-uh, 70E is not a low voltage standard. It covers all voltages. And if there are elements in here, then you should use them. So what does NFPA 70E do? NFPA 70E helps us with this risk assessment procedure in terms of identifying hazards, assessing our risk and risk control. But there's two other golden nuggets in it. It covers human performance in terms of human error. And then after we've assessed our risk, can you see there under 1.2, uh, under 1.2, where it says assess risk? After we've assessed our risk, the risk controls come in and it tells us how to do point number three, which is the hierarchy of risk controls. Okay, so let's let's start off with the back to basics. Let's start off with the back to basics. Okay, so identifying the hazards. Folks, electrical hazards, how many do we have? Think about it. How many electrical hazards do we have? Okay, easy peasy, easy peasy. There are only two. It is electrical arc flash and it is electrical shock. That's it. Electricity wise, you are either going to get burned or you're going to get current through your body. You're going to get burned or you're going to get current through your body. Those are the true core electrical hazards. You can get shocked by touching something or you can get shocked by stepping into an area where the ground voltage, like, like Mother Earth, the dirt that you're standing on, the ground that you're standing on, creates a voltage, right? Those are the two mediums for electrical shock to pass current or electricity to pass current through our body, which is electric shock. Then you have arc flash where something goes boom and it goes boom and bah, and then you get that blast and you get fire ignition, which is the thermal component, and you get blast, which is the pressure component. Now that you all are super specialists on understanding what the two electrical hazards are, let's drill a little bit deeper into this. Folks, I can touch a doorknob in a dry area or a door handle, and I can get a static discharge. Guess what that static discharge is? It is an electric arc flash. Do I need to go to the hospital every time I get a little zap from static? Absolutely not. So what's the threshold of it? The threshold of it is twofold. Number one, you need to be inside the arc flash boundary. And inside of the arc flash boundary, the energy is greater than 1.2 calories per square centimeter. Now, some of you may use two. Some of you may be using 1.2 calories per square centimeter. How do you determine this energy? Very simple. You need an engineering arc flash hazard assessment, 
or like an engineer within your your industry or somebody that helps you getting your engineering study talks to you they do a study on your plant and they put stickers out there on your equipment and that sticker will tell you what the energy is if you are a utility you may have a procedure that say hey in this transmission yard here's what we have in the substation here's what we have in this building here's what we have etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's several ways to skin a cat okay um I don't know why I use that terminology, um, but 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 there are several methods to this. So there are several means to this end, right? The other electrical arc flash hazard is when you have exposed energized conductors. So first is the threshold. You need to make sure that you have enough energy to cause serious burns. The second is exposed energized circuit parts. And the third one is when you are interacting with equipment, like opening up a cover, opening up a door, removing a cover, opening a door, switching something on, switching something off, racking in a breaker, racking out a breaker. If all of these terms are foreign to you, please don't be intimidated and lose me at this stage of the presentation. It's okay. If you don't understand this terminology, your electricians understand this terminology, your plant operators understand and if your plant operators don't understand this terminology as well, folks, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about you. I'm worried about you, okay? Then you have the electrical shock hazard. The electrical shock hazard is anytime you are approaching. And please don't take this for granted. People always think electrical shock hazard is present when, when you touch something. No, it's not. It's a certain distance, and that distance is made clear in OSHA and NFPA 70E. Folks, I'm trying not to get into the weeds. I'm leaving this high level. Please, 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 we can talk about this as we need to talk about this. Um, drop me a question if you have most uh, more, more, more questions. With, with with regards to this. You have any of those present, anyone, this is like an OR gate. If any one of those are available, you're in the shock or you're in the arc flash hazards, okay? Now, let's talk about this risk assessment. Let me ask you a question. Think about this for a second. Right? Have you all ever exceeded the speed limit? Have you all been speeding at some point or the other, right? Think about how dangerous that is, especially if you come up onto a curve that may be sharper than your car can handle, do you all agree that speeding is indeed a hazard? Okay. And if you answered yes to that, it drives my point home that you do not understand the difference between risk and hazards. A hazard is anything that can physically harm you. Speed does not have a force component in it. Speeding is not a hazard. Think about it, folks. If you said yes, you really need to go back and think about your true deep understanding of hazard identification and risk assessment. And don't feel bad because I also didn't understand this at a time. I, I do get it now, okay? Speeding is a risk condition that may result in a crash and the crash may cause mechanical forces to your body which may cause damage to your body and that is the hazard. Speeding is an at-risk condition. So when you decide to break that rule and speed, when you decide to remove the covers of something that is energized, when you decide to work on something that hasn't been maintained, for example, there are two things that come into play. Number one, what's the likelihood of something going wrong? So I've got my directional app on and I'm looking for any police notifications, any speed traps, and if I have a speed trap there, the probability of something going wrong, of me getting a fine is pretty high, right? But if I know I've driven through this for the past 20 years and there's never a cop on this road, what's the likelihood of me getting a ticket? Very, very low. So there's two things. If I lose control and I crash the vehicle at 120 miles per hour in a 55 mile per hour zone, the probability of me getting hurt is going to be fairly high, right? Especially if my car is not maintained and, and do you know, it's an old vehicle. It doesn't have airbags, et cetera, et cetera. The likelihood of serious incidents, uh, the likelihood of actually crashing is, 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 is pretty high. And that leads me to the next, which is, well, what's the consequence? What's the consequence? Actually, do you know what? I got so carried away with talking here. I should actually cover this in the slide. When you're assessing risk for arc flash and electrical shock, you've got to take four things into consideration. 
You've got to take into consideration, what am I working on? How big is this equipment? How small is this equipment? How much space do I have? What task am I performing? Am I measuring something with a voltmeter? Am I trying to tighten a screw? Am I trying to um, reset something that isn't resetting? What about the person? What about me? What about me as the individual? Have I done this task before? Am I qualified? What about the environment? Do I have loud noise behind me where I cannot hear somebody calling out to me and saying, hey, Zaheer, stop, you're going to hurt yourself. What about the environment if I'm at an elevated position, for example? So you're going to use these four to determine what's the likelihood. Now, when it comes to severity, severity and consequences, right? So my car is really old. So if I do crash, I don't have airbags. Uh, the last time I tested my safety belts was probably 10 years ago. So the consequences are going to be very bad. So electrically, what does this mean? Because I want this to be a practical presentation. What I'm saying here is that if your voltage is more than 50 volts, there's a good, there's a good chance of you being zapped and there being serious consequences to it, right? Now, what happens if there's an arc flash? Well, if the energy is greater than 1.2 or 2 calories per square centimeter, you do have a chance of igniting your non-arc rated clothing, right? If you are in a substation and you are not using EH rated, electrically rated safety shoes, there is a chance that you may get electrocuted. And there's an instance also, have a look at the paper by, um, this is a peer-reviewed public, um, a peer-reviewed paper that's published in a journal. I've added it here at the bottom. You can take a picture of it and go and read it. A very interesting article because people said, oh, why must I use this arc-rated clothing? Because if there's an arc flash, the blast is going to kill me. Folks, no, 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 no. All of the science has proved this otherwise. In almost all the accident, not in, in every accident investigation that we have performed, not one instance was the blast the cause of the fatality. In most instance, it's, it, it, it's um, the body giving up from uh, respiratory complications, and then it's the arc rate, non arc rated clothing. It's your uh, poly cotton t shirts, your poly cotton shirts, your regular non arc rated denim jeans that are uh, catching a light, and those things are burning and killing people. So don't just say, I'm not going to use arc-rated clothing because a blast is going to kill me. No, folks, that is not true. Get your arc-rated clothing. Now, that risk analysis. Let's talk about that risk analysis. Number one, when you do your risk assessment, when you start it, you got to make sure that you are not starting your risk assessment assuming that, oh, Zaheer is going to use gloves, Zaheer is going to use arc-rated clothing, Zaheer is qualified. No, the the initial risk assessment must not take any of those into consideration. It must ask, who is doing the work? Oh, it's Zaheer. Is Zaheer qualified? Um, well, I, I, I don't know. All right. So start off with that. Does the arc flash label say that the energy is greater than 1.2? Yes or no? Okay. So you are going to use all of those. Now, um, how do you go about, because a lot of people feel intimidated by this. Once again, I've got another link to a paper out here. Take a picture of that. And I love this paper because it creates a detailed checklist of electrical work. So you need to ask yourself in your risk assessment, do I have signage? Is my equipment maintained? Who is the person working on it? Does that person have the right tools? Does the person have the right spares? Um, are all of these available? Are they tested? Are they up to scratch? These are the things that you need to ask yourself. Now, before all of you are getting intimidated and scared and, oh my gosh, my electrician is doing 50 tasks. For 50 tasks, you need me to do this for every single task? No, 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 folks. Don't get intimidated, please. I'm going to try and bring it back and 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 we're going to make it practical. Just hang with me for a second. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get to that point, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to create a system and you can do a two-level system. You can go low risk, high risk, or you can go low risk, medium risk, and high risk, right? And you can ask yourself, well, what makes it medium risk? What makes it high risk? Okay, okay. So now you've got all of these colors. You know it's a green. You know it's an orange. You know it's a red. Now what do you do? Because it's, the, it's that matrix which is looking at the likelihood versus the severity, right? So 
if I am having an arc flash, but my arc flash is in my hotel room trying to hold a door handle, guess what? The severity is going to be trivial, right? So although it is almost certain in the middle of winter in a dry, arid area, when I touch that door, I'm going to receive a shock, right? I know that that is a score. It's, it's, it's the likelihood is certain. But if the severity is trivial, guess what? It puts it down to maybe a green or a yellow. Why do these colors matter? Because you all need to determine if the risk assessment comes out green, right? That you are giving the electrician permission to proceed with the work. If it comes out orange, you are asking your electrician, hey, can you please discuss this with your supervisor? Or asking the supervisor, can you please discuss this with the electrician before we go? And if it's red, then red may mean, hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. We now need to ask the manager. We now need to call in the engineer. If we don't have any of that, I'm going to call a friend um, who, do you know, um, has, has experience in this area. Maybe it's a manufacturer. Maybe it's a safety consultant that you use. Maybe it's somebody at your other branch that you call, okay, for that red item. So that is why we have green, yellow, and red. Those things uh, change the level of authorization. So that was a pretty loaded slide. All right. Now, now before I go to the next slide, oh my gosh, we've introduced this thing called human performance. And people say human performance. I've seen so many training classes on human performance and everybody talks about this and it's pie in the sky. It makes absolutely no sense to me. So here's what I did. I used my practical in-field experience and I tried to make some of this language more understandable. Folks, when we talk about human factors, we have three primary modes. And this and the next section are the core of today's presentation, folks. I really want you to understand this. And I really want to go through this in a way that makes sense to you. Okay, follow me. Help me, help me to help you understand this. We have three primary modes of errors. We have rule-based, knowledge-based, and skills-based. A rule-based, knowledge-based, and skill-based. Let's look at rule base and let's look at the four instances. Let's look at the mode, right? What can cause this? Let's look at the error in physically. How would the error manifest? Let's give you a practical example. And then let's not stop there. Let's give you a possible control. So number one, a rule base error is tribal knowledge. Um, and folks, please, I'm using this as a hypothetical example. I am using this as a hypothetical example, right? It's... Um, Oh, whenever the circuit breaker trips, I just reset it, right? And that was a tribal knowledge that was passed on to me. The error that I may have is that I may reset a breaker, which may be under fault conditions that's not maintained. And when I reset that breaker, boom, arc flash, right? Or it's, oh, we have a zero tolerance process, um, uh, zero tolerance approach for anybody who does not use a meter to verify uh, the absence of energy. Okay, you've given me that. Now the error is I mismatch the instruction to the application. And now what I do is I take my 600 volt rated meter to a 2300 volt motor and I go to measure it and boom, there's an arc flash because the meter is underrated. That is what we call a rule-based error. To be able to address that error, we need you to go out to the job site. We need you to understand the system that you are working on, the tools that you are using. We need a self-check with verbalization. Hey, um, am I using the correct tool? Hey, John, does this work for this particular breaker? Yes or no? That is what we call a rule-based error. I'm hoping that some of my examples have helped you make sense of it, all right? Now, the next one we have is knowledge base. On knowledge base, we are uncertain about the task. We lack the skills necessary. We may have done this on another piece of equipment and we think it's the same, but it isn't. So we use the incorrect rule for the incorrect equipment or worse yet, nobody has told us what we do. And what is the error, the, the error mechanism here? So that's the mode. The error mechanism here is that people drop these mental pictures. They have insufficient information and, and, and their vision is limited. 
Remember, you can only look in front of you. Your blind spots are your blind spots. Unless you don't turn and look over your shoulder, you're not going to know what those blind spots are. So a practical example of this is, oh, this is only 120 volts. I work with 120 volts in my house. So why do I need to use a glove here? Oh, it's because the boss man said I need to use a, a, a glove or the boss person said I need to use a glove here. So what do they know? They're a CEO. They've studied accounting. What do they know about electrical safety? So I'm not going to use my glove because this is 120 volts. What they fail to realize that 120 volts in your house is completely different, electrically speaking, to the 120 volts in the factory, right? So that is why you need to use a glove. And I think we've had other webinars where, where we have spoken about this in detail. So what do you do? You have a pre-job brief. You say to Joe, hey, Joe, hey, um, Sarah, this is... Uh, 120 volt control. I want you to only stick on to the 120 volt control. It is this color wire. If you see wires which are these colors, we're not going to touch those wires. We're not going to put our meters on it. We're not going to use a tool on it. We're going to make sure we have our glove. We got to do our glove inspection. And you know what? If you're uncertain about this, please stop and call me out to site. Don't assume anything. Just it's, it's, it's a text message, it's a phone call, call me, call me, all right? And then the last one we have is the skills-based error because on the skills-based error, it is like, oh, this is like, um, you know, bag of potatoes, bag of potatoes, bag of potatoes. I take it off the truck, I throw it on the conveyor, take it off the truck, throw it on the conveyor, take it off the truck, throw it on the conveyor. So it's repetitive, it is repetitive. It is what I do. I bypass the interlock, I open up the MCC bucket, I hit the reset button and I move on. This is one of the biggest ones that we try to address through human factors. And that is that skills base, that repetitive. It's like it's it's we become complacent. And then what we do is we don't know what the actual risk versus the perceived risk is. And that is switching a disconnect. Folks, how many of you have switched a disconnect without giving it a second thought? How many of you have forgotten your one hand rule, stand to the side because yeah, it's a 30 amp disconnect. A 30 amp disconnect is a 30 amp disconnect. Who cares about this? All right. Um, bucket trucks around live line work. We just jump on a bucket truck and um, we we set out our outriggers. We get onto the bucket truck and we go up to the line because we're so used to, to it. Well, What's your clearances? What's traffic doing? Um, what's the tree trimming in that area looking like? So in these cases, that pre-job briefing becomes so important. That job site review, the three-way communication. Hey, hey, Zahir, I need you to switch breaker number seven or disconnect seven A. Oh, John, you need me to switch breaker seven A? Zahir, that's correct. I need you to switch breaker seven A, confirm. Okay, so that's the three-way communication we're talking about. The four main drivers to this, folks, is the task demands that sometimes people are overloaded, people are not in a good mental space. Add to that the individual capacities in terms of how much each person can do differs, and then the work environment, right? I'm not just talking about the work culture, but I'm talking about the physical work environment as well as the um, the the just the nature of people of making mistakes. Now, now. Unfortunately, this doesn't cover everything. I need to talk to you about other things, right? There are other considerations that we have. Your risk analysis method. How are you analyzing risk? How are you taking a troubleshooting incident and bringing it back to being able to perform a risk assessment? Okay, so sorry, I just closed my chat window by, by mistake. Okay, so here, here it is, okay? So number one, we need to create checklists, right? We need to refer to other people to help us to make sure that these checklists are complete. NFPA 70E is a great first uh, first look for the tasks that people have. Hey, if you don't have NFPA 70E, if you didn't receive NFPA 70E training, take your electrician, take your supervisor, walk down the plant and say, oh, what is this thing called, this box here? Oh, that box is called the MCC, right? Now you know that that box is called the MCC. Now you can ask, Okay, so when you're working on the MCC, well, what are you guys doing on this MCC? What are you folks doing on this MCC? So the other tool that you have for your risk analysis is sitting down with the team. You all, I don't know if any one of you did these funny management training that they do with us to learn like 
communication. And there's one way if you're stuck in the desert um, and you only have these and you can only take this out of the plane that's about to crash, what would you take? Would you take the compass? Would you take salt tablets? Would you take the water? Would you take a mirror? Would you take a blanket? Right? And then you put on all the things you need. Then what they say is get into the group and then the group then decides on those things. Well, I have always found that although I generally score fairly high on those things, whenever I sit with the group, the group score is always higher than my individual score. So in the same way, we want you to understand these risk analysis, analysis methods, right? So you need to understand that it is difficult to incorporate human factors. Folks, that one slide that I did previously is doesn't do justice to human factors. I do not believe that people have made human factors um, practical. So what I want you to do is I want you to walk with your workers. Take your electricians out to site, take your supervisor out to site, take your safety officer out to site, okay? And um, promote this discussion around what are the modes? Do you remember the modes were the slides that I just showed you now uh, uh, before? And what are the controls? Start having a discussion around this, right? And avoid huge checklists. To, to, to address hu hu human factors. Make it easy. It's that KISS principle, keep it simple, silly, or stupid, or something, right? Um, yeah, just, just focus on what it is for the person. If I, am, if I am only working an eight to 10 hour shift or a 12 hour shift, you know, and that is the company rules, why would you ask me about, did you double shift? Did you work a dual shift? You know, make it, make it applicable, make it applicable. And, Involve the human resources specialist here. You know, as much as we believe that they don't know anything, HR is pretty, pretty knowledgeable. HR people can be really sharp at times. And then your risk assessment should not merely be office-based. Folks, I'm telling you this over and over and over again. You need to go out. You need to look at it. You need to be confident with what you are doing. Be clear on what's my scope of work, what is considered a scope of work, a, ch a change in the scope. Here's what I'm going to tell you before I jump off this slide. It's very, very easy. If you are using a meter, you are using your eyes, and you are not using anything else, you are troubleshooting, right? If you're using your eyes, you're using a meter, you are troubleshooting. As soon as you put that meter down and you pick up a tool or you take your finger onto a button, you have now changed from troubleshooting to either, either service and repair or operating. You've transitioned, the scope has changed. Make your electricians aware of this. That that I've just given you now is an absolute golden nugget. That is a thing that can save lives, all right? So now you've done your risk analysis. You said, hey, we've got this checklist. Uh, Joe is going out to the MCC. He's gonna open the MCC bucket. He's gonna be doing this. And uh, Sarah is going to this control panel. Sarah is gonna be opening this door. Sarah is gonna be doing this. You've got all of that. Sarah is gonna be using a meter. Sarah is gonna be replacing fuses. Sarah is gonna be doing this. You've got all of those. Now for each of those, ask yourself, what are the hazards present when Sarah is doing this action? What does this action lead to? So using a meter. Is Sarah familiar with the meter? Has she been trained on the actual use of meter? Is the voltage rated, um, is the voltage, the nominal voltage of the system, nominal means close enough for the system voltage, is it rated for the meter that Sarah is using? Okay, so those are the questions that we are asking in our risk assessment. Then we're gonna say, oh, based on this matrix now, on, the, on what Sarah is doing, it comes out to a green, it comes out to a yellow, or it comes out to a red. Okay, so you've got that. Now the question is, well, what are we gonna do? Because Sarah is going to open this control panel door and when she opens the door to this control panel, the arc flash label in there says 3.7 calories per square centimeter or it says category two clothing required or it says level two PPE or it says minimum eight calories per square centimeter required. Now, now you are gonna determine your risk control. Your risk control, folks, isn't always, oh, we're going to give Sarah PPE, she's good, Sarah, go and do the job. No, absolutely not. This is where your hierarchy of risk control comes in. And what the safety says, what the safety science tells us is that we have this hierarchy, and I'm going to run through them very quickly, okay? So the first one we have is elimination. People talk about this hierarchy of control, and I see it all the time, and it's so 
blase because it's 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 just wordsmithing people are not telling me what i need to do let me see if i can fix this problem for you in the next six minutes okay so number one we have elimination elimination of the hazard is your first first most effective risk control strategy remember folks we got this three levels hazard identification do i have shock do i have arc flash then i'm going into my risk analysis What's the likelihood of this hurting me? What is the severity if this thing does materialize? So likelihood and severity are put into a matrix. And based on that, I'm now taking a decision on what am I doing? Elimination of the hazard means I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, excuse me. I'm going to wait for you to turn off, create an electrically safe work condition. Then I'm going in. So people will say, okay, fine. You're working on this MCC bucket. I'm going to turn this MCC bucket I'm going to turn the breaker in the bucket off and now you can go and work. Well, 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 inside that bucket, the line side of the main breaker is still hot. That means energized. Okay, hot is another word for energized. Okay, uh, it, it could be hot because you did an infrared scan as well. Then I'm worried about other things. But um, okay, so is that true, 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 true elimination of the hazard? You may decide yes, and that's fine for your risk assessment. Or you may decide, uh, no, this is not safe. I'm not happy with this. Then you may say, okay, wait, I wanna go and switch the upstream breaker that feeds the line side of the circuit breaker so this bucket is completely dead. And that may be how you choose to eliminate the hazard, right? So elimination is one. Remember folks, elimination also can be at risk because I may switch off a circuit breaker, I may lock out, I may rack out, and then I could have a mechanical failure on the system that causes an arc flash. So remember, elimination, you gotta think about it carefully, all right? You gotta think about this carefully. Now, the next one I wanna talk about is substitution. Substitution is either I'm gonna take the person, I'm gonna substitute the person with something, or I'm gonna substitute the hazard with something. What do I mean? Right? So instead of standing in front of equipment and pushing a start-stop button, depending on what the arc flash energy is, maybe I say, hey, I'm going to implement remote switching. So I'm going to have a long lanyard that takes me away from this, equi from this equipment. I'm going to stand far away and I'm going to turn this breaker on or off. Then I can have remote racking where I'm standing at a distance racking. I could, um, I could have this automated. I could use a long lanyard. And then the best one that I think is a great substitution is why are we still using 120 volts control? Control system. All of your new equipment, if you get your control voltage less to 50 volts, you are going to win, okay? Because less than 50 volts, no shock hazard, no arc flash hazard. And folks, here I'm talking about normal control instrumentation voltages. Engineering controls. What are engineering controls? Folks, have a look at this IEEE P 1814 standard that's been, um, I think it's been balloted or has it has been completed through ballot, but that is safety through design. What they're talking about is when we design for safety, like for example, if a breaker that came out of the shop, you just install it and nobody goes in and sets this breaker out. Well, if there's a fault, this breaker is not gonna trip as fast as it needs to. But if you use some engineering work and say, hey, turn it to this value, turn that to that value, turn that dial to that value, you're now reducing the energy available. What about when you buy new equipment? Instead of buying something that blows the door onto the worker, why don't you say I'm getting something that's internally arc rated? Why don't you get arc quenching and arc suppression devices? What about finger safe? Finger safe means that if my hand slips or my tool slips, that I cannot accidentally land my hand on 480 or land my finger on 240 volts or whatever. That is called finger safe separating control and automation circuits. Folks, I'm talking to your engineering team out there. Those are the people who this engineering control applies to. The next one is awareness. Now I'm back to my engineers and my safety officers and my um, supervisors. You can stick arc flash labels. You can put out warning signs. You can set up barricading. Awareness is fantastic. And then you end up with the last two, which are least effective in terms of risk control. And that is administrative controls like, hey, does Zaheer uh, have the required training to work on this 2,300 volt system? Does Zaheer have enough training to be able to remove the cover out here? Do I have an electrical safety program? 
Now, my electrical safety program is paramount. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Risk assessments, control of hazardous energy procedures, audits, et cetera, et cetera. And the last, least effective control. Please have a mindset change. If you take nothing else from today's webinar, take away this, that PPE is the least effective. Folks, I am admitting this in a public domain. There have been instances where I had to remove my glove to write something down on my iPad and I'm then putting my hand back in and I'm thinking, oh, wait, this doesn't sound right. This doesn't look right. And then I realized that I took my glove out to write something. And then when I went to close the door or whatever, I realized I didn't put my glove on. And then I quickly went and put my glove on. So this may not be malintent. It may not be people not trying to use PPE because they want to circumvent the system. No, it is human performance and human error, right? So when we talk about PPE, we're not just talking about personal protective equipment, but we're also talking about personal protective clothing. We're talking about gloves. We're talking about shoes. We're talking about hard hats. We're talking about insulated tools, insulated mats, right? So remember that the top three, top four, I'm going to say, are the most effective and the bottom two are going to be the least effective. So remember that, remember that, remember that. Okay, what are the failures? Um, practically, we fail to use electrical gloves, dielectric gloves with um, protectors over them. We fail to, um, do you know, doors that may not close, may not latch correctly. Um, we try to then fix it. And fixing that door that hasn't closed is actually a scope change. It is a scope change. If you went to troubleshoot and the door's not closing and you try to close the door, it is a scope change. Fusing issues may not have the right size, may not have fuse pullers. And then, do you know, just, I mean, it's, 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 it's tough. Now, before, before I conclude, okay, I know we've got nine more minutes here. I, I, I want to run through this very quickly. Uh, folks, I would have really loved to spend a lot more time on each of these slides. I'm telling you, some of these slides, I could have a webinar on them alone, okay? What questions do you have? Please, 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 if there's anything unclear, drop those in the comment section. I will work with you to make sure that you understand this. Now, I want to talk about these three things, baseline risk assessments, standard risk assessments, and continuous risk assessments. Oh my gosh, people really, really slip up on this and then they make risk assessments so complicated. Let's talk about the first type of risk assessment, your baseline risk assessment. Your baseline risk assessment exists in your electrical safety program. Do you remember early on in the webinar, I said to you, oh, Zahir, but Joe is going out and doing 50 different tasks. Now you want me to cover PPE and tools and everything for these 50 tasks? No, absolutely not at that instance, not the way that you're thinking about it. Here's what I want from you. I want a written electrical safety program, a document that gives me specific instructions. Oh my gosh. And if you are going cut, copy, paste OSHA, there isn't an electrician or an engineer that I know of that is going to find something definitive from standards language. No, you need to say to them that my electricians working on this plant are going to use a class zero glove, right? They are going to use this over protector. You are going to say anybody who does repairs in an energized state needs to have this qualification, means that they need to use, uh, be, be exposed to 1910, dot, um, 1910 subpart S, training, or they've got to be trained to 1910.269, or they've got to be trained to the NFPA 70E, uh, whatever that is, you got to define that. And you got to say, I've got class one of workers. I've got class A as workers. I've got class Z as workers. I've got class uh, 100 or, 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 or whatever, and have your different groups of employees, of personnel, and say, this group is going through that training. This group is going through that training. Here is how I am making sure that they understand how to use a live line tool, how they need to use a, um, oh, and look there, I, I, I made a spelling mistake. I, I, instead of tasks, I wrote tax, 
tax permitted and, and energized. Okay, so uh, yeah, we just passed tax season now. And um, hey, my birthday is on tax day, by the way. It is like one of the saddest days of the year for me. So, <laughs> okay, no, folks, I'm just kidding. I really enjoy playing, <laughs> paying my taxes. I can't even say that with a straight face. I'm sorry. Okay, so requirements for energized work. You need to define all of this for your baseline risk assessment in your electrical safety program, right? So when are we performing energized work and when are we not? Your standard risk assessment. This is the ones that I want you documented and I want you performing this either the day before or the day off. Right now, also it depends. You may need earlier because maybe this needs to go to your manager for approval and your manager is not available. So don't leave it for the day. Try and do this the day before. This is the day or the day before that you are walking out, you're looking at your equipment, you're looking at your site, you're seeing that your site conditions are still the same. And this is where we're looking at the people who are doing the work, the equipment and the environment. And finally, 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 oh my gosh, I could talk about this for an hour. I could talk about this for a day. The continuous risk assessment. Folks, one of the biggest things we've been knocked at here, when I say here, I mean in the US, is that the US is very compliance-based. What I'm going to say now is very philosophical, but it is true. We have science that's proved this, is that in the US, and this is becoming a problem globally is that we after this checkbox, we want to just check it. Yes, we've done that. We've trained our people. We've given them the right meters. We've labeled our equipment. Check, 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 check. And in all of that check, we're not taking care of making sure that our workers, that we as an organization have a safety and a risk-based culture. Culture, culture, culture. The risk-based culture. This is where people are not taking shortcuts. This is where people believe that they can do this work in a safer environment, right? Getting to that level, and we are far away from this. The continuous risk assessment, being mindful, being present, right? What was the procedure? What was the scope? Am I allowed to change this? So in conclusion, read what I've written out here. Okay, take a second, read this. And with that, I'm going to hand over to you, Alan. Well, thank you so much. And before we start the Q&A, I want to remind everyone the evaluation, the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. The survey will open in a different screen as this webinar. And your input is important because it does help us improve our future webcast. Um, yeah, it looks like we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, the first question, does this mean that every time you enter the arc flash boundary to activate or deactivate a breaker, that PPE for the excessed incident energy shall be worn? Yeah, this is a contentious one because um, NFPA 70E introduced this language called normal operating condition. So what they said was if something is properly maintained, properly installed, and um, there's an unlikelihood um, or it's a failure is unlikely to occur, what they are then saying is that under those conditions, your likelihood of your risk assessment drops down. That means that the likelihood of an event is reduced and some people perceive this to be, well, if the arc flash is not going to happen, if electrical shock is not going to happen, then I don't need arc-rated clothing inside the arc flash boundary. However, however, there's another OSHA standard that says when you are inside the arc flash boundary, you need to be protected from the tip of your hair to the tip of your toe with arc-rated clothing. So you have the OSHA guidance that says, yes, arc-rated clothing shall be required. And then you've got the risk-based approach in NFPA 70E that says, well, if an arc flash isn't really going to um, occur, or they don't believe that it's going to occur, or it's extremely unlikely to occur, then you don't need the arc-rated clothing. Here's, here's, here's my summary on that answer. It is so important that you understand that the NFPA 70E states it is unlikely to occur. What do they not state? They do not state that it is impossible to occur. I am not telling you how your organization needs to work, but if it were my business and if it were my employees and if I was the person doing that job, as soon as I enter the arc flash boundary, I will be kitted out with arc rated clothing because entering the arc flash boundary means I'm going to switch, I'm going to um, open up, I'm going to troubleshoot, I'm going to try and do some repair or whatever inside the arc flash boundary because that's how the boundary is created. I know of many companies that have now got their operators, all of their operators 
arc-rated clothing. They've got them face protection, head protection, uh, because their operators are switching devices which may not have been maintained and they are being exposed to this. So this is a fantastic question. Thank you so much for asking these questions. We need to get more arc-rated clothing out there and it's not only our electricians who are exposed to the electrical hazard. Thank you for that question. Well, speaking of clothing, uh, this person says that, you know, clothing can only be washed for a certain number of times, but can that clothing be washed with softeners? No, actually, no. The clothing can be washed as many times as you want to wash it. Um, all of the research and the practical testing that we have done so far shows us that the arc rating of the clothing is pretty stable irrespective of the number of washes. Now, if the number of washes affects the integrity of the clothing, that means you get holes, you get tears, you get fraying of the clothing, obviously then the arc rating is jeopardized. Now, with regards to the question of using softeners, there is a study out there that's unofficial, that's not published, that says that a moderate amount of softeners that is naturally included with your liquid uh, detergents, that's naturally available with your uh, pods that you are using, that's naturally available with the powder that you are using, that is generally considered an incidental amount of softeners. Right, and um, what the research is showing is that that doesn't affect the clothing too much. However, 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 the answer that I've given you is the practical answer. The reality of it is that OSHA states that the manufacturer's instructions shall be followed. So if the manufacturer says do not use softeners, don't add additional softeners. Well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um... As a reminder, any unanswered questions will be forwarded to today's sponsor. I'd like to thank Zahir Juma, the entire team from our sponsor, eHazard, and of course, all of you who joined us today. Take care and have a safe day.